I would like to most warmly welcome Shannon Mattern. Uh, Shannon is the Penn Presidential Compact Professor of Media Studies at the University of Pennsylvania and the Director of Creative Research and Practice at the Metropolitan New York Library Council. From 2004 to 2022, she served in the Department of Anthropology and the School of Media Studies at the New School in New York. Her writing and teaching focus on media architectures and information infrastructures. She's written books about libraries, maps, and urban intelligence, and she contributes a column about urban data and mediated spaces to Places Journal, which I strongly recommend people checking out. She'll be the two, uh, 2025 uh, Klug or Cluj, I'm not sure how to say that, Chair in Modern Culture at the Library of Congress. You can find her at wordsinspace.net. Shannon, thank you so much for joining us. I will hand it to you. Great. Um, so just because I changed my setup, I'm assuming, ho hopefully you can hear me correctly. You can see and hear everything okay? All right, great. Much more clear, thank you. Great, uh, so we just did a, a little switcheroo. I moved to a different floor of my house to be closer to a stronger internet signal. So hopefully this will eliminate any glitches. So hi, everybody. It's nice to be kind of virtually back at the new school. As Melanie said, I was there for about 19 years. Um, uh, still, I'm in New York often, but I'm joining you from Philadelphia today. So I will share my screen and get started. All right. OK, um, Melanie, could you just let me know, is this uh, appearing at full screen? Can you see the slides? I can, yes. Great. OK, so I am going to try to go through this quickly. I packed probably too much into this. Um, but uh, uh, the theme for your or the purpose of the Cloud Salon, I was told by Shin, is to think about a creative process or where do people get ideas for projects? So a question I frequently ask and I talk about in my methods classes is where do ideas come from? Um, I had a kind of a heterogeneous background. My mom was a special education teacher, yeah. a lot with neurodiversity. My dad had a hardware store with his brothers and is a cabinet maker. I was a chemistry major and then switched to an English major and then did a PhD in art history and media studies. So I just, the, the breadth of different fields, the fact that we're dealing with neurodivergence, with craft, with making in various formats, and both scientific and humanities and social scientific methodologies really has informed my understanding of where research ideas come from, where ideas come from in general. And I translated a couple of those kind of more personal autobiographical things into articles I've written over the past couple of years. On the left, you see a piece that I wrote trying to make sense of like my upcoming, my upbringing in a hardware store and how that craft knowledge really informed the way I think in a piece I wrote on the left called Community Plumbing about the history of the hardware store as a really important social infrastructure. And in the right, I wrote a piece about dementia care. My mom, as I said, was a special education teacher for about 40 years. She also, unfortunately, has Alzheimer's now. So just seeing the kind of the her own trajectory of dealing with different types of neurodivergence, both working with people with neurodivergence and my family dealing with her own neurodivergence right now, and how we design a world and spaces and infrastructures to really better support people with neurodivergence and um, memory issues. So these two pieces came out of my own personal autobiographical uh, ways of intersecting with my own um, with my own research interests. So I'm mostly a writer, but I also collaborate on exhibition and design projects at the Metropolitan New York Library Council, which is a state-funded not-for-profit that bridges a few hundred libraries and archives across New York City, everything from the New School Library to the NYPL to MoMA Library to a variety of different archives. So we, there we collaboratively build systems for sharing public knowledge. I also regard my teaching as a creative practice and a means of knowledge creation and sharing too. So these are the different realms in which I work in which I have to ask these questions of where do ideas come from? Uh, my creative process typically begins by looking for portals, doors or interfaces or facades to civic and socio-technical systems. So a little kind of illustration of that. So how do I find a small thing to think with that op allows me to open up an, into understanding a larger, often really complicated, and sometimes productively and beautifully messy system? So I'll start with, a, I'll do a couple different units here, a couple different chapters. So the first thing I often look at is urban interfaces. 
I wrote a piece about, or actually almost exactly 10 years ago now called Interfacing Urban Intelligence. This was around the start of my interest in smart cities and kind of urban technology. So I wanted to think about all the different, very capacious, creative ways we could think about giving interfaces, both to city managers and administrators, and to just everyday members of the public to understand all the different ways, uh, uh, the, the systems that allow their cities to operate and the different forms of intelligence that are present there. So you can see on the right, some of the different examples I used, everything from big kiosks that look kind of like the link kiosks that are all around New York City now, to in the bottom left, uh, more experimental, kind of almost like installation or kind of public fair um, uh, type uh, things where we can think about using architectures themselves as interfaces. That then manifested or morphed into another piece I wrote a, a year later call, um, about the history of the urban dashboard. Dashboards are everywhere. We have dashboards to look at for even like my new school in a way, which many of you are familiar with is a dashboard that allows you to access any types of, you know, your grades, your registration, uh, bursar, payment issues, all types of things. So this piece looked at how do we, uh, the history of the dashboard, everything from its use in kind of horse-drawn carriages to early cars to cockpits to NASA mission control, as you can see on the left, to its use in various urban contexts to help us have a, a way of interfacing with all of the different data-driven systems that make a city operate. Is again, there's just some historical examples. And on the left here, you can see from Patrick Geddes proposed using a, a museum itself as kind of like a dashboard in architectural form. Each floor represents a different way of an interfacing with or understanding a layers of operation of a city. The top right, we see a war room, which is often used in kind of military strategy. The bottom right, we see Cybersyn, which is kind of like the military control center for Ch the country of Chile. So just historical um, examples of dashboards. A couple of more examples. Um, you can see the Bloomberg terminal, the top left. CityStat, which runs the system that actually Air, Mayor, Mayor Eric Adams played a role in helping to cultivate CityStat as the statistically driven system for driving the NYPD in New York City. Two various kind of lots of cities have dashboards like the one in the bottom left. So again, just more examples of interfaces to these larger, really complicated systems. I also was very interested in... Um, uh, this is a, just a personal interest I've had for many years. I'm not sure how many of you act, interact with these anymore because they don't really exist in many train stations anymore. But up until about four or five years ago, several stations across the um, Northeastern Corridor on Amtrak had these really fantastic flip, uh, split flat boards. Now they're often, there are some companies who make boutique versions of them and you'll find them in shops and restaurants and coffee shops, et cetera. But they were an integral part of our urban transportation infrastructures until relatively recently. There's a lot they can do that they're really good at. The big glaring LCD screens don't do very well. So I wrote about the history of this, this technology, what's gained and lost by supplanting them with new kind of um, purely digital interfaces and how they have, there's been a kind of resurgence in the use of technology, this technology by a lot of artists and designers. One of the most recent pieces I published was also about the use of a big screen. Um, you have, if you've been to Times Square, an area I try to avoid at all costs because it's not very pleasant to inhabit, but you'll see that there are screens all over the place, including um, one of the earliest screens, the Spectacolor Board, which is run by an artist named um, Jane Dixon. Uh, she was trained as a as an art. I forget what her actual training was, but she was the first person to run the Spectacolor board. Happened to be an artist, commissioned a lot of her artist friends, like Jenny Holzer and other folks, to produce public art on the Spectacolor board. Karma Gallery, with whom for whom I've written a few times, it's a gallery that has some outposts in Los Angeles, the East Village. They asked me to write a catalog essay about her work for a new retrospective. So I looked at how her work with a Spectacolor board translated into her way of thinking about painting, her work with tile and mosaics. So just the, her engagement with texture and the granularity of different substrates, how these are all interfaces to her experience of the city and our experience of the city as, engage, as people who engage with her work. Uh, this is also some of these interests have manifested in some of the classes I taught at the new school, including a class I taught for several years called Urban Intelligence, another one, a bit of a mouthful of a title called Data Artifacts, Infrastructures and Landscapes, where we looked at everything from container ports to factory farms to surveillance systems and how data really drive our understanding of urban systems. 
and logistical systems. I've also thought a little bit about, or not a little bit, a lot about how material things, material like urban settings, quotidian spaces are interfaces to help us understand things like urban flows and social infrastructures, et cetera. So I wrote a piece a couple of weeks, couple years ago about the sidewalk itself as an interface. It is kind of a mediating zone between the street and facades of buildings. It's also a space for the mediating or the kind of the marginal creatures of our city inhabitants live. That is their home in many cases. Um, and also with the rise of new digital technologies, it's also a space that's hyper-mediated. This is a space for signs. It's a space for companies like Sidewalk Labs, for instance, to try to quantify and monetize different uses of sidewalk and curbside development for things like ride shares and scooter rentals and delivery infrastructures. So just this sidewalk as a medium in multiple senses of the term. And the next chapter would be pipes, cables, and tables. So again, more physical types of infrastructures. Uh, so my, my 2017 book was really looking at a lot of these material things and how they play an integral role in helping us to engage with the systems of our cities. So you can see on the right, the table of contents, there's a chapter on wires, um, the chapter on steel and ink and print, another chapter on mud and brick and inscription on city facades and sidewalks. Um, and then the final chapter is about more immaterial things like voices and sounds. So these are all like the way the physical city itself serves as an infrastructure or a container for all of our both digital and analog forms of communication. Uh, keeping in the pipes theme, I also am really interested in pneumatic tubes. So I wrote a chapter a few years ago about the history of the pneumatic tube system, which you can see in some shops, like some co coffee shops use them as like a little kind of a, 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 a gimmicky type of, of, um, of attr attraction. But they did at one time play a very vital role in the postal service. And in libraries, pneumatic tubes were how people sent little slips of paper and mail around the building or around cities. Just in the interest of time, I'm probably going to skip over this one, but I'm also interested in kind of the backstage labor that allows things like library books to move around between the, the multiple hundreds of different outposts throughout an urban library system. A historical example I wrote looking at kind of the work of um, Paul Atlay, who is a Belgian information scientist, thinking about how we can scale up all of these different infrastructures from card catalogs and index cards, all the way up to city design to develop multi-scalar infrastructures that allow for the distribution and sharing of information. I've also been interested in kind of things like tables and chairs and furniture and how the design of things like desks with all these interesting secret drawers and false bottoms is a way to help us understand things like contemporary cybersecurity. So how even the design of our furniture is a way for us to interface with the knowledge, the material media that we keep in it and sometimes try to secret away in it. I also published a piece a couple of years ago for Eflux about the tables that we find and the chairs that we find in various Silicon Valley workspaces and how they really kind of shape the way people perform digital knowledge or digital knowledge work. Also written about the history of the bookshelf and how bookshelves, whether they're purely utilitarian or very kind of, um, as you can see behind me, these are some nice bookshelves that some local Philadelphia work um, uh, uh, woodworkers made for us here in our, our row how, home. So just the both the cosmetic and the aesthetic and the very functional roles that bookshelves have played, especially in the era of Zoom, when having a nicely stocked bookshelf behind you plays a role in kind of cultivating and communicating your identity. And then, as I said, I kind of alluded to earlier, libraries are a, have been a big theme throughout my work. So I think about all the different ways we interface with the myriad knowledge resources that are available through library systems. So my first book was about 15 different libraries across the country. And I looked across scales to see how everything from their architectures to their interfaces allowed people to engage with what they had to offer. I'm going to skip over this. This is just a little screen, a couple screenshots showing I've written a lot about libraries. This is just a sample of the different articles and projects I've done with libraries over the years. Also done work, some work with exhibitions. Um, so interfacing using the exhibition or kind of site specific artwork as a way for publics to interface with library systems to understand the different types of work that they do. 
Another example of an exhibition I did with um, nine different creative, or actually it might have been 11 different creative technologists. Some of the names there in the middle, the participating artists might be names that you recognize, people who have taught at MFA DD program. They're among the contributing artists to this exhibition we did. We wanted to use public art in the public libraries as a way for patrons of multiple generations to think about digital privacy in new and more capacious and creative ways. So just a few other boundary objects or kind of things to think with and emblematic sites that um, that I have written about to help us think about um, as portals to or our, our interfaces into situated informational geographies. Obviously, the split flap is one example of one of those emblematic and really charismatic objects. I also, throughout the pandemic, the pandemic gave us a lot of objects or things to think with. I wrote a piece for Art in America about Andrew Cuomo's uh, slide decks and how he kind of developed uh, certainly a public persona because of the way he and his team designed their slide decks, decks excuse me. I also heard about plexiglass, the ubiquity of plexiglass as a clear interface that really kind of communicated our relationship to public health and one another throughout the pandemic. Um, and then I think this is one of the final examples I'll show. I uh, One of the most recent pieces I published in May was about the cardboard box itself as an interface to understanding larger logistical networks. Especially during, during the pandemic, cardboard boxes that came to our door were often our interface to the outside world, our interface to global commerce, our interface to get, having things delivered to us that we would one, at one time have gone out to get ourselves. So I'm looking at all the different ways the cardboard box is an interface to these bigger systems. And now we can kind of read the box itself, the graphic design on it as a symbol of its identity, of the different terrains it's passed through, all the different labels and codes that we think, things that we find on cardboard boxes. So this just is an example of kind of, I visited a tart, did a tour of a cardboard box manufacturing facility, looked at kind of recycling protocols, all the different things by looking at something as seemingly simple, simple and tiny and mundane as a cardboard box is a portal to all of these different systems. Histories of graphic design, global logistics, uh, the forestry, how kind of even the paper we need to produce cardboard boxes is transforming its geoengineering, or geoengineering our worlds, transforming our forests, as you can see here. And simple cardboard box being reused as homes, as domiciles for some people, as substrates for kind of political messaging. Um, and a lot of my work with Metro, more recently the Library Council, allows me to think about some of these things in more creative ways. So this is a relatively new role for me as the Director of Creative Research and Practice. And we're thinking also about how to use the library as a portal in new ways to help uh, multi-generational, several million people across the city and the metropolitan region think about how their library can serve as an interface or a portal to new modes of kind of knowledge production and knowledge sharing. So these projects reflect some of my larger, longer-term pedagogical goals and values. The things I study are, in a sense, not only kind of technical and social infrastructures, but they're also ethical and ideological to kind of reflect my own commitment to public knowledge and public sharing in the commons. And again, I'm I, in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip forward here. So, so some of these final projects were a bit, bit about how the ethical considerations are central to a lot of the work that I've done. Uh, just returning at the end here to how even just the role of this, the hardware store, going back to my earlier biographical framing here. So this being a way, it's this is kind of an interface for us. So it's a portal for us to think about a world that we can make and repair and shape ourselves. And one thing, if any of you are familiar with Crest Hardware in Brooklyn, which had its very last day of operation after 62 years as a family run shop, it closed just last week, it had its last day. So what is lost when we lose these kind of portals to a world of our own making. So this is my kind of leading into my prompt for you. Um, so this is a piece I wrote back in 2013 where I'm encouraging us to think about how to design worlds that allow us to understand their methods of operation, their operational logics, and to help us figure out how we can fix them, repair them, and shape them in ways that actually serve us and our values. So this is a, a paragraph I'm going to read from that from the piece called Infrastructural Tourism. We might explore whether there are other there are ways to account for infrastructural units and operations that don't easily translate into more conventional or visual graph forms. 
In one of his last books, the planner Kevin Lynch suggested that the landscape, through graceful land management, might open itself up to scrutiny and accounting. Planners might ensure that the inner workings of various functional elements are there to be seen if one is interested. More specifically, Lynch envisions guidebooks to the sewer system with instructions on how to read the season and the time of day by watching the flow. Signs, obscure marks, and traces of activity, listening devices, diagrams, remote sensors, magnifying glasses, slow motion films, periscopes, peepholes, all of these things that we, and especially you as designers, could potentially design or contribute to the public realm to help people better understand how their city operates, how their world hangs together, and what role they have in shaping it and helping to keep it in a state of good repair. So this is my prompt to you. So I'm encouraging you to, over the course of the next week, to imagine an experimental or speculative interface in analog or digital or hybrid form that, that would allow a particular community, perhaps especially one that's con uh, communities that are conventionally marginalized, to engage with and appreciate the nuances of, rather than merely to track or to surveil, some urban system or process that typically escapes people's notice and interest. Things like where your waste goes, or how care happens, or how, I don't know, things that we don't typically think about that actually are essential to the operation of a city. So how might you design a speculative and experimental interface that helps us to understand these things better? Um, but also to think about how to do it in a responsible, ethical way so that it's creative, critical, and, in not, and encourages non-extractive methods of observation. It's not just about watching and tracking people, but actually doing some thinking more critically about what our observation, what the politics of our observation are. How might such an interface help us steward, say, care for immigrant populations or threatened ecosystems? So what I'm asking you to do, and what you can work on with your various kind of breakout session instructors is to submit an annotated diagram outlining your interface's features and functions. So I think I'll stop there. That was totally a whirlwind, uh, but I am happy we have time for discussion afterwards. So I'm happy to kind of unpack any of these examples and answer any questions you might have. So I'll stop sharing. Yep, I have the first question. This is Mawa. Go for it, Mawa. Okay. Um, how do you approach teaching complex subjects like media infrastructure to students with diverse academic backgrounds? And thanks so much for the presentation. That was great. Okay, uh, thanks, Mawa. I think this whole idea of like portals and uh, inf interfaces is really helpful. Uh, for example, when I taught my class on media artifacts, infrastructures, and landscapes, I feel like the artifacts component is like the smallest scale. And that offered a really um, accessible port of entry for students coming from multiple backgrounds. I will say that in my 19 years at the new school, I typically had students from 10 to 15 different disciplines in the classroom together. That's kind of what I became known for, I think, is having really interdisciplinary classes. Lots of design and technology students, architecture, urban design students, and students from the humanities and social sciences. And uh, they came to my classes in part because they knew that's what they were getting and they wanted that, that interdisciplinarity. And I think starting with the artifacts level or having students choose an interface, something that is seemingly small and contained, then allows them to use that as a portal to explode out and to explore larger systems. So to understand things like urban inter urban uh, infrastructures, for instance, I might have as a student might choose to analyze the history of the mailbox or um the mail truck or a specific post office, or if somebody wants to understand transportation infrastructures, I've had students who have studied things like the link kiosks around the city. So something seemingly small and contained, then when you actually do the research on it to understand its history through which it was generated, the different kind of city agencies and corporations that are in partnership producing this thing, the problems it's supposed to solve, and then the new problems it accidentally creates in trying to solve those other problems, Mm -hmm. This allows you to understand the complexity of those systems. So I always have an assignment in all of my classes. For example, the infrastructures, the artifacts class, We every student chose an artifact. And we made like a, a glossary of artifacts. In my maps classes, every student chooses one map. And that single map allows us to do this kind of explosive understanding of different, how different systems converge on this one seemingly tiny thing. So I think that having 
that small starter point. I used the term boundary objects in my talk, but I didn't get time to go into it. This is a term by a science and technology studies scholar named Susan Lee Starr. And a boundary object is a thing that is kind of like people from multiple fields, practices, disciplines can rally around. Everybody has some, some sense of familiarity with it, and it gives everybody a common ground to then have an interdisciplinary discussion around it. So something like a mailbox, a map, uh, a kiosk, an interface, a plexiglass barrier between you and the bank teller. These are all things we all have seen and have some sense of familiarity with. We all think about them in different ways, though. But having that boundary between us, that object that kind of is an interface between us for a discussion, that that then gives us a chance to have these more expansive discussions. So I hope that helps. Yes, thank you. Great. Jonathan, I think you had a question. So you said you started in chemistry and then moved to English, and then you finished with art history and media studies, I believe. Um, Pretty close, yeah. How do you think, um, how do you think these various fields uh, relate to and have informed your approach to urban interfaces? Yeah, so I would say that uh, studying, um, having a bit of a science background, I did not finish in chemistry, started to think I was going to go to medical school, but at least being exposed to that, those methodologies, that epistemology, the idea of, ex the idea of experimental practice really helped me to understand data science in a different way as a non-practicing data scientist. There are lots of people from the humanities and social sciences who write often critically about things like data-driven urbanism, surveillance culture, but don't always have a practical background in how algorithms are designed or applied kind of in a kind of everyday practice. I think having some of that exposure in my own kind of early education helped me to understand kind of that culture of knowledge production and how ideas and how research questions are asked. I also think I came to realize that initially that one of my primary interests in chemistry was the aesthetics of the lab. I just loved test, you know, test tubes and petri dishes and color changes and the order of instruments, for instance. So this helped me to recognize it throughout all of my research that I'm really interested in kind of the, how aesthetics play a really integral role in shaping how people know things. If people, you know, we see that in the manifestation of the design of interfaces. We see it in the design of public buildings that have to make themselves intelligible to people so they know how to use them. So I think that some of those threads, um, uh, the materiality of chemistry also, I'm really interested in materiality, the stuff of communication, the pipes, the substrates of paper, the flipping flaps of a split flap display. So that's a thread that's kind of woven throughout my work too. So um, yeah, I uh, and then also the fact that I was in literature for a while, uh, not for a while, I actually got a bachelor's degree in literature, reminds me that it's not just the physical infrastructural stuff, it's actually analyzing the text itself. So I think having this merger of different inter intellectual backgrounds, when I analyze anything, I'm both like reading the text, doing a close reading that you would draw from literary studies, and analyzing the infrastructure and thinking about kind of computational logics. So it allows for a real triangulation of methodologies to understand any subject that it might be studying. So I hope that helps. Thank you so much. Um, Ray, I think you had a question. Yeah, uh, first off, thank you. This has been awesome information. Um, something about what you've been speaking about that stood out to me specifically is when you talked about the cardboard boxes during COVID and how these were kind of a product of all these, all the systems and information work that you're talking about. I guess my main question is, what do you think could also serve as a lo-fi example of a product of these systems? And how do you think the the design of those, those types of things is changing as, you know, we're moving more towards, I don't know, kind of a, a society that cares less about, I think maybe the packaging and more about the, uh, you know, stuff that's inside, even though I believe, you know, that always we should be able to understand what's inside from the packaging as well. So I don't know. So another example of a lo-fi object or artifact that helps us understand all these complex systems. Um, well, you know, I mean, maybe it's not necessarily about like distribution systems. The cardboard box helps us understand like how capitalism works, how global logistics work. Um, I would say that uh, you talked about the stuff inside the box. I would say just the packaging, this, this, the, the peanuts, the, the recyclable packaging materials 
that might be a little bit too literally connected to the box itself. But the fact that we see an evolution of the, the from these plastic styrofoam peanuts to these inflatable plastic wrappings to a lot more experimentation with organic biodegradable materials, that both tells us a lot, again, about consumer culture, about global logistics, but also about increasing desire for and demands for sustainable sustainability and biodegradability. I'd say... You know, I talked about plexiglass. This is a totally different realm, but like plexiglass is a seemingly lo-fi, simple, it's a piece of plastic, it's a piece of clear plastic. What could be simpler than that? But its ubiquity throughout the pandemic really reveals a lot to us about our sense of social obligation, about the failures of our public health system, about how our economy needs us to just keep chugging along, even though we need to stay separate from each other. So you could read in this screen that actually has nothing on it. It's clear, it's transparent. But this clear screen, this clear interface said so much about our attempts to get back to normal and the failures of so many systems to protect us. So that's another example of a lo-fi, seemingly nothing interface that set, that can be read, uh, that into which we can read so many different cultural values and, and systemic failures. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I think... Thank you. I think we have about 10 more minutes. I would, um, first I'm going to ask Sheen is this, if this is okay. Can we open it up to uh, questions? Great. Um, do other folk, uh, let's see, do other of the 74 people <laughs> uh, present have questions for Shannon? I know, I know, I know I do, but I'm going to, I'm going to uh, wait maybe a couple more seconds. I, I actually had a quick second question, yes. kind of a follow-up. Nice. <laughs> Go Ray. So you, you're talking about like um, the, plex the plexiglass and the cardboard box examples as more so, um you know, kind of more, what's the word, metaphorical, uh, I guess, products of this. Um, of, of basically just society as we're discussing it. Um, my question can also, I guess, be tailored kind of towards the fact that marginalized groups get less access to like things, for instance, like if we're talking about like screen design to show off a specific way to, you know, categorize this or organize this, marginalized groups are receiving less of that um, just based on the fact that they receive less technology, less more up-to-date um, technology. Uh, how do you think they're... How do you think we can go about correcting that um, in, in, in the industry? Sorry if my question's a little rushed. No, that's great. I mean, this is why I feel like, and again, I I pack, I tend to do this. I pack too much in thinking like I 20 minutes is much shorter than I remembered. But um, this is why I love working with libraries. I mean, it's not the sexiest topic. I have taught various kind of libraries and archives classes throughout my 20 years at the new school. And I often had a lot of design and technology students in those classes. <laughs> who through the process of working together this semester really thought they wanted to work with libraries, with public knowledge infrastructures. Yeah, you're not gonna make as much money as you would if you went to work at Google or another star or some startup, but the ethics of the work that you're doing, the fact that you are explicitly there to serve all demographics of a population, um, uh, especially the folks who do not have access to things through any other means, that was really appealing to a lot of students. So this is something that like librarians and technologists working with librarians have to think about often um, is how do you make uh, the re the digital resources that people might otherwise know are available? How do you allow people to get online who don't have internet access? I think it's still close to 40% of the people in New York City do not have access to high-speed internet outside of school or work. So when they go home, this is why during the pandemic, you see people sitting on the stoop outside a library or parking in the parking lot of the McDonald's to get access to the internet they need to do their work and to do school, to get to go to school. So this is where I feel like librarians are really good at thinking about the media mix that's necessary to reach people who might have visual impairments, various disabilities, might be homeless, might come from socioeconomically disadvantaged families and communities. And there they really think about like, if we wanna help a homeless population, for instance, or a population struggling with mental illness, maybe an app 
isn't the best way to do that because not all of them are going to have smartphones. Maybe instead like zines or little publications, print publications. So this is something that I think, again, librarians and other folks interested in like community engagement, really think about what media formats are actually going to reach and have the most impact for the communities you're trying to reach. It's not always a digital interface, not always something like in the metaverse or an app of some sort, because those some people just do not have access to the technology to, to avail themselves of those resources. So this is, again, why I love working with librarians, because they're always attuned to uh, the recognition that they're working across generations, across so socioeconomic strata, across different degrees of access and privilege, and the opposite of those. Okay. Um, thank you so much. There is another question from Giovanna in the chat. Giovanna, uh, would you like to read your question out loud? Um, if not, please just say it in the chat, I'll read for you, but it would be great if you are able, if you can. Yeah, I can read it. I just have um, headphones in and there's some sound bouncing around. So I don't know if the quality is great. We can hear you. But, okay, great. Um, so I'm really interested in like cities as interfaces. And I know you mentioned that the city is digital and analog in its communication. And I just was wondering what you think about a smarter city and how you teach in a sense, like the general public to use a city as it's changing, as it's becoming more digital, less analog. How does that kind of, how do you think about that in future society? Yeah, well, this is where the topic and theme of a lot of my classes and my most recent book, A City is Not a Computer, where as the title might indicate, I think that it's not necessarily, and it's not necessarily a good thing that it's the case that cities are becoming more digital. There are responsible, ethical, non-extractive ways to use digital technologies, but there is still very much that is embodied and analog about our urban experience. We still need parks. We still need public spaces to gather. We still need, for all the reasons I mentioned in response to the previous questions, analog forms of media technologies. Even our digital technologies have analog components, the routers, the kind of the, the, the cables and wires, et cetera. Those have to be attuned or um, kind of accommodated as well. So in terms of how you teach a public to um, use a smarter city, first of all, it depends upon what you mean by smarter. Smartness has kind of become a branding term. It's used to mean kind of hyper digitization. I think if we have a very capacious understanding of what actually kind, what types of intelligence matter in a city, we realize that not all of it is digital. We look again at like multi-generational knowledge, indigenous knowledge, multi-species way of navigating and you and kind of and stewarding space. Some of these like can, can draw on digital technology, but some of them are kind of beyond the digital, don't lend themselves to datification, for instance. So recognizing that ideally we'll always be both analog and digital simultaneously, how those technologies and kind of platforms can work together. Then how you teach people is I think asking those ethical questions about how you have a responsible blend, kind of a, a, um, a complementary blend of analog and digital thing uh, tools. Um, and then... The, the the public pedagogical part, there are lots of different things you can use. And I think it's, again, it's a matter of triangulating, layering, using a whole bunch of different pedagogical tools for different populations. You might know of, for instance, the Center for Urban Pedagogy, which has been around for probably 20 years or so. They do a lot of things where they develop kind of videos, have high school students develop videos. They develop uh, booklets, again, going back to the mix of analog and digital to help people understand, for example, like how the sewer system works, or if you're a street vendor, what are your rights? How can you avoid being harassed by the police? Um, if you are a population that is especially subject to surveillance, how can you protect yourself? So CUP is one of those organizations that really thinks about how to use analog and digital tools in responsible ways to help people understand how the city works, what rights you have to shape it, how to protect yourself, how to contribute to it being a more inclusive and responsible place. Um, again, libraries are a great group of people who think about this too. They, for example, just last week, I was in an event at the Brooklyn Public Library that is an event series organized in partnership with city planning commissioners to help translate into generally intelligible language, how zoning works, how sustainability programs work, they made a zine that all of us went home with. They have a website too. 
So again, it's thinking across a range of media formats, each of which serves a different communicative purpose to help people understand the logics of how a smart or intelligent or wise city works. So those are just two examples of different institutions, um, CUP and libraries who are thinking about these pedagogies. Incorporating civic education into schools, I think, is really important too. helping kids understand why they should care about transportation networks and um, logistics and uh, public knowledge infrastructures, things of that sort. So how do you incorporate these things throughout the education system, too? Amazing. Uh, thank you so, so, so much, Shannon. That's like perfectly timed. Um, Libraries are the new community centers for good or for bad is in the United States because of how civic funding works. Librarians have a lot of jobs that they may or may not have had 50 years ago, mm -hmm. um, but have always been community leaders in different ways. So thank you so much for bringing that 